I'm going to attempt with this video to show how numbers uh, based from 0 to 9, the zodiac, the sky, uh, sacred shapes, and time all kind of have an interacting relationship. And this is showing us that we're basically on a wheel. So this wheel at the bottom of this graph here is is the zodiac wheel and it's showing the cross section here of the where the zodiac needs to be for this change to happen and that is the same cross as the Templar cross which I've shown in uh, previous videos. If you look at all these time cycles you'll notice that everything um, diverts back to the number nine. Like if you add the numbers together and then you bring it down to just a single digit number, it always comes to nine. All the time um, uh, errors come down to nine. All the platonic solids, where you see five of them here, all their angles end up uh, breaking down to nine as well. So nine is really a sacred number and I'm going to explain how this relates to the zodiac. To get through the whole 12 zodiacs, it takes 25,920 years, which also adds up to nine, and that is one great year. Each individual zodiac sign takes 2,160 years, which also breaks down to nine. I know some people's beliefs believe that occult knowledge is is evil or it's like satanic or witchcraft and the zodiac is considered to be part of that but really for me it's just a fascination with the story in the sky and what the ancient tribes were looking at and how they could predict calendars like the Mayans knew that this time period was going to be great change and I'm fascinated with how they understood that and the knowledge that they learnt from learning that, like what were they using it for? And I realize it has a lot to do with um, being able to control energies and energy vortexes and using different um, energy sources on the planet by understanding the sky. So if you notice here this graph that I made, at the top we have two uh, planetary systems. We have Saturn and Jupiter. Saturn is Earth and Jupiter is fire. And if you notice the alchemic symbols, which I have here in orange, one looks like the number five, if you really use your imagination. The other one looks like number 24. But these symbols really are, looks to me like a sickle. And the other one looks like, like a crescent moon and a cross to me. But it ends up being, a, you know, in my mind, a five and a 24. So here we have the cross of the zodiac. And we're coming into this time period. This, this wheel basically moves uh, backwards in a, it's called a procession of the zodiac. It actually moves backwards. So we're coming into the age of Aquarius. And uh, the Aquarius is man. It also represents air. The pinnacle is like the five-pointed star. And playing cards, it would be diamonds. It's eternity. It's also winter. And in, uh, I guess it would be a Hebrew, it's, a, it's part of the second he. Now, over on the right-hand side, we have Scorpio, which uh, the planet is Pluto. It represents like a feathered bird, so an eagle, a swan, or a phoenix. And uh, water, or a cup, or a cauldron. In playing cards, it would be heart, universe, spring, and the first he. On the left corner is Taurus, which is Ve Venus, which is the bull. We see that in New York City, the bull. And um, earth, sword, playing cards would be spade, man, and autumn, and it's va. And the right-hand side here would be Leo, which is the sun, which is a lion or a tiger. Uh, fire, uh, it's a wand, playing cards would be clubs, and god, and summer. So we have the yod, he, va, he. This is relevant with um, occult and also, I think uh, in the biblical, they, they sometimes have this abbreviation of YHVH, I guess it would be. And uh, that is relevant as well. So I just want to let everybody know that I do not have a lot of knowledge on tarot cards or occult knowledge. I'm just really fascinated with the number system and how it all interrelates with the ancient alphabets and the, the 
the constellations and how the, the wheel works. And I'm just trying to put all that together. I don't belong to any organization, uh, religious or um, occult. I'm just looking at things from a, a very blank perspective, a neutral perspective that I just find fascinating how this stuff was all put together. Here we see it as um, the zodiac wheel as well, exactly what I just showed, but how they managed to figure this out was all to do with the sun, um, the winter solstice and the summer solstice and the sun rises. And you can see how this exact pattern is done just by uh, watching the sky. So the great year, which is 25,920 years, is divided into four seasons. And we see them here in a biblical context. And we see he's sitting inside an almond shape, which is, this is the Vesica Pisces. It has to do with um, sacred geometry. When you join two circles together, you get this shape. And we see the four zodiacs that I was talking about previously in the four great um, ages of the seasons of the great year. So the representation of this uh, ages, these four ages, is also... Um, in Buddhism, it's not just in Christianity, and it's also uh, shown in other religions as well. Now, occult knowledge, which most people don't understand, is actually part of the biblical knowledge. So here we have in Revelation chapter 4, 1 to 7, After this I look, and behold, a door was opened in the heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it, it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show the things which must be hereafter and immediately I was in spirit so you become into spirit and behold a throne was set in the heavens and one sat on the throne and before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were beasts this is what the four ages are full of the eyes before and behind and the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf, which would be the bull. And the third beast was like the face of the man, which is the age of Aquarius, the man being the angel. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle, which is the scorpion, which is very close to the eagle constellation in the sky. So we have the four ages in the Bible of the zodiac. Here is the Vesica Pisces with the two circles joining together. And I'm going to explain this to you later on in the video where this is actually in the sky. Here's some ancient stones that I wanted to show you this symbol on. So we have the eight uh, spool wheel, but then we also have just the cross with the circle. And I do believe this is all to do with the zodiac, but also the, the, the Christ cross with the longer tail on it ends up being the constellation Cygnus, which is like a swan, but it also looks like a sword. Now the shape of the star is very important. If you notice, it does equal phi, um, and this upside down triangle actually goes to water. This is the alchemic symbol for water, the upside down triangle. So this, this um, sacred phi-pointed star is very important, and if you notice it, it looks like a Q, the phi, which I've explained in my past videos. The four points also represent like the zodiac, which would be earth, air, uh, uh, fire and water, and spirit is the top. Now here's the symbol, um, and it's showing it in ancient cultures and uh, hydrographs. It uh, basically means God or heaven. So um, that is really important in this whole story. And we're going to show how basically God is in the sky. It's in the stars. Now at the graph that I did at the beginning of the video, it had um, at the top two planetary systems, which is Jupiter and Saturn. And if you look at the alchemic symbol, it looks like the number 24 and the number 5. And this is really important because this is relating to this five-pointed star, why this 5 is so important. But um, we're going into a conjunction with these two planets in 2020. Um, so this is very important. It's, the fact that we're going into this is, is extremely important. It happens every 20 years, but at this particular time, it is going to be in the age of Aquarius, which is very significant. Now, if you do a word search on etymology, which is basically the root of the word where it derives from, um, Jupiter 
which is the symbol, the 24 symbol, is God, it's Father, um, to shine the sky, the heaven, the God, the Father. So it's also Zeus. So this is interesting that this planet relates to the God of, uh, in heaven. So when we get into religious text, uh, the number 24 was used 20 times in the Bible. The number 600 was used 24 times in the Bible. Um, the number 7 is used 24 times in the Quran. Um, the, words, you, the word judge is used 24 times. So the, word, the number 24 is significant, and I do believe it's because it relates to the planet Jupiter. So you see here, even in um, biblical text, they're saying that the number two and four equals six. And this is significant because of, you know, um, Genesis with the, the sixth day being of creation. And the number six is basically the Merkaba, which is the star of David, you know, whichever way you want to see it. It's the two vortexes of um, pyramid up and pyramid down, V up or V down, which ends up being the six pointed star. Of course, when I get a number stuck in my head, I have to see where else I've seen it. And this was funny when I started looking at the lyrics of um, Piper's at the Gate of Dawn, Pink Floyd. It's all about the number 24. They say the chapter 24. And they're talking about how the numbers uh, relate. You know, you add one and then you get the number. You go through the lyrics here. I'm not going to read them out to you. But it ends up, he's this whole event is happening on the winter solstice and that is uh, very significant the whole winter solstice and how when you start understanding the numbers they do relate to six and then you add one which creates um, you know divinity so the these numbers are very significant how they're using them here is the final countdown um, music video uh, here it's coded, the, the clock is at 4, but it's 22-4. I noticed this clock on a song called um, Oath. It's a pop song, and it's at 24. So 24 is relating to Jupiter. They have to tell us. It's, it's like kind of in our faces, but unless you know the numbers, you don't notice it. But uh, the law of one is everything has to be told to us, and we have to voluntarily go along with it. Here is One Republic, their song called Counting Stars. You know, they're telling us about the stars, to look at the stars, but also that we are the stars. I do believe our souls end up being the stars. And Dan Winters explains that in a scientific format uh, and how it relates to plasma science and everything. But this video here, there's a reptile in the video, which is the dragon serpent knowledge. Anything reptilian, like... Uh, snakes or dragons it's all about that knowledge and their clock is also at um, 24 minutes to you know so they're showing us as well there's tons and tons of music videos that show us and I will do a video on all that when I did the etymology on the word Latin because the Romans seemed to have suppressed a lot of this ancient knowledge and when they got into control it all seemed to get hidden so it was really interesting that the, the word Latin means to lie hidden. And it also relates to the planet Saturn. Saturn the, is the, Cronus is the god of Saturn. And Cronus relates to chronological, meaning keeper of time. So in the golden age, there won't be any time. Here is just showing Saturn and Jupiter, the time that they're coming into conjunction. Their final conjunction is December 21st, 2020, um, age of Aquarius with uh, 30.3 east, which is, you know, the number 33, which is significant in occult uh, numerology. So, yeah, this is um, crazy because if you notice other times when all through history, it's never been in Aquarius before. If you want to have an in-depth understanding of exactly the dates that this conjunction is happening and how the two planets are moving in and out, you can read this through. Also, uh, it ends up being in Aquarius on December 20th, 2020. I'd just like to read this one paragraph about the conjunction. If the taking apart of the old system is a more gradual process, there will be more time for humanity to awaken and become more self-empowered. 
while it is true that many severely harmful and destructive things have been forced upon humanity by the tinery uh, lockdown and quarantine, humanity and earth has been under a very long time playing the victim as an excuse to be lazy and not take responsibility for its own survival. Where uh, creative evolution is possible, causes this empowerment. Individually and collectively, we always face choices. It is our responsibility of every citizen on earth to take responsibility to work daily um, with discipline and perseverance to create positive change by taking responsibility for our own evolution into higher consciousness. So it's just basically saying there's going to be a transformation um, through consciousness and humanity uh, through this conjunction. So here's the um, conjunction, what it looks like in the sky. We have Saturn, Jupiter, and Earth, and it ends up creating this Y symbol. Now this Y symbol relates to confluence of two rivers where they join. Um, and I'm going to explain how that is working um, through CERN. And also um, in another location in the United States, it's really important where two rivers meet and what that means. And I just wanted to show you here in the um, Back to Future movie with the time travel, uh, there's this Y, the same symbol behind him in the window, which is part of the whole time um, travel system. So this Y symbol is, is extremely important, and I do believe it all relates to the sky and through this uh, conjunction through Saturn and Jupiter. Also, the symbol of the Y relates to our DNA, the Y and the X. Now, we have the X through the zodiac, which I explained at the beginning of the video, and this is the Y, and the X and Y relates to our DNA. Now, if you don't know what CERN is, it's this big hydrogen uh, collider that is in um, Switzerland, and it happens to be in a town called Merlin. And this um, town also had, well, it's in Geneva, but the little suburb is Merlin there. And you'll notice that it's a big circle. It also has a Q in it. And the, the miles of this tubing that goes through is 16.8, which is phi. Um, and if you watch some of my other videos on math, it, it'll explain what the whole phi significance is to Q. And what's interesting, it relates right through um, these two rivers joining together. So the confluence of these two rivers coming together, there is some type of like kind of magic um, symbology going on, or I actually think it's physical as well, where the water joins, you know, watch the water. This is really important, um, how two rivers meet. Now with CERN in this large hydron collider, it's interesting the names that they've used. You know, they've got Atlas, which relates to mythology with holding up the skies. And, you know, they're, they are opening up dimensions. When you get your head around that, they're opening up dimensions. I don't think people really understand what that means. And every single country pretty much in the world donates to this company that is doing this. So the, all the governments know exactly what they're doing. It's interesting they also have the word eagle in there, which relates to the part of the zodiac um, that I showed you at the beginning of the video. The, the you know, the phoenix, the swan, the eagle, all has uh, mythology relating to um, the golden age, you know, this, this new dimension we're going into. And they're trying to open dimensions. So that's all very interesting. And here we have Atlas, which here it says, Celest he's holding up the celestial heavens for eternity. And the word Atlas also relates to Hercules um, and Atlantis, island of Atlas. Okay, so if, you know, if you go into some mythology uh, about Atlantis and what they were doing there, and if you want to really understand our history, that's an important part of our history that's been kind of left out and made to us to believe that it's all myth. But it seems like um, it's not so much of a myth when you start to see anthropologists starting to dig at certain sites. Um, there's one in Africa uh, uh, basically showing that most likely that was a main headquarter of um, the, the Atlantis um, civilization. An antipode is the exact opposite location to the planet of a location, and the exact antipode of CERN, which is in Geneva, is the Chatham Islands, which is off the coast of New Zealand. This was a very peaceful civilization, 
that lived there. And uh, what was disturbing is when they got conquered, they were actually eaten. And this I find bizarre because you, you hear about uh, Tibetan monks being murdered as well and their body parts being sold and really disturbing stuff. When you start to realize that in the extreme situations of good and evil on this planet, you know, everything is about this battle. And also the Bilderberg meetings where the elite get together every year and decide how they're going to run humanity. And there's a Chatham law that says no journalist is allowed to report on those meetings. So I don't know if everybody remembers the eclipse that went across in uh, 2017 and it's going also across in 2024 creating this giant X across the United States and it actually is going across a town called Cairo twice which is in the south of Illinois. The town sits on two rivers, the main river being Mississippi and the other river being uh, the Illinois River which is the confluence of two rivers. And in that location, there's some very significant sites. There's a place called the Hicks Dome, which is a, basically an old um, volcano that has lots of minerals and crystals um, that they've been mining out of there. And also a place called um, Carbondale, which is kind of like the center point where they're saying the eclipse is happening because the poor town of Cairo, which used to be called Little Egypt, which, you know, with Egyptian knowledge, occult knowledge, this doesn't surprise me. Um, but this town used to be like a big heyday town, had lots of uh, significance uh, with steamboats going up the Mississippi. And now it's basically a ghost town. It's like they've destroyed the town, which seems weird for two rivers are joining. This town is just a ghost town doesn't make sense to me. It's like the energy is being purposely made to be low there. And why I say that is because of the crystals in that Hicks Dome. Um, the crystals are used, you know, they, they, we, we use them in our cell phones. We have them with us. So if you think crystals and all that stuff is like really woo-woo stuff out there, it's not because they, they, they hold energy. And so does water. Water holds energy um, and, and memory. So where rivers join and where there's this crystal um, place, uh, it, it makes me really think that this is a very important area in the United States. And um, the stuff that they're mining out of there, it's a fluorescent uh, crystal. I think it's called uh, flor fluorite. Um, and you can see it has, um, it's a special ultraviolet light that goes through it. So, you know, it's interesting how it's a very special crystal and uh, you know that it happens to be exactly where this eclipse is going across and here are all the ley lines through the United States and what's interesting is all these little green stars every place where there's one of these green stars there's some type of um, crystal boot uh, which is like an old volcano a butte they call it um, and uh, the, the Native Americans use these energy points um, for, you know, uh, rituals and fertility reasons and stuff. Here are a whole bunch of them. You can see across here, they're all on the 39th parallel. And you got the Hicks Dome in Illinois. That's exactly where the eclipse is going across. So I find this super significant. How it all, it all relates to the sky. What's happening on Earth is relating into the sky. The story is in the sky. It's just trying to figure out what the story is. And here on the 39th parallel, all different buildings and stuff. The Pentagon, Fort Knox, Area 51. Um, you got um, different, different sites here. San Francisco, um, Mammoth Cave. These caves, okay, ha are full of crystals. Okay, th this is not like, you start, I'm going to do another video on it. Because there's some beautiful sites. Um, and very interesting uh, things about the native cultures and, and how, you know, they were using all these ley lines um, to create energy vortexes. Um, this is all part of the serpent dragon knowledge, you know. It is basically knowledge that's being stolen from us that was actually used for good, but it ended up being corrupted and used um, to kind of repress us. Um, have low energy on the planet. William Rockefeller was into these, you know, uh, mining these pits. This is other pit called, and they had a company called and uh, Anaconda Copper Company. And this guy basically got lynched. Um, I think his name is Little. 
yeah, the workers turned on them. Uh, and they, yeah, they were mining all this stuff out of um, these giant old volcanoes. And it makes me think, like, were they tall or were these crystals taller at one point in time, like millions of years ago? Here's one of the uh, buttes. And I think this one is called the Devil the Devil Tower. And the Native Americans are trying to get it changed because they want to call it, I think, um, the Big Bear or something relating to the, the Big Dipper. Um, the bear is fertility. Okay, so it's interesting how we've kind of, you know, the white man has turned it into an evil place. You know, it's the devil's tower and really it was a sacred place. And here they're saying how these places are sacred. This is from this um, this park where this is. So, um, yeah, it's, I'm going to do a whole uh, history thing on all these places because I just find it really fascinating and they're beautiful to, to look at some of these caves with all these crystals in and how sacred these spots were. And even in um, South America, they were doing the same thing there. You know, so it, there's something to it. It's not just oh, a bunch of crazy old civilizations doing this. There's something super important to these places because they, they I guess, go into the earth and into the water system. Here we t we're talking about um, um, the um, s serpent knowledge and the dragon communities. Okay, rather than reading it, because it's going to make the video extremely long, and you can come back and look at it and read it. Um, it's basically saying how these ancient civilizations were, were using like pyramids, stone circles, obelisks, um, and creating structures to, to help um, capture the energy from these um, ley line places that were um, conjunction uh, through these crystal caves and, and how they were using them. Uh, and it, I find this stuff so fascinating because it starts to make me understand why these cultures were so repressed um, and why, you know, a lot of the history is being kind of swept underneath the rug. And here is an old Stonehenge that is in um, New Hampshire, I believe. It's 4,000 years old. And you can, you know, it's hard to believe that, you know, civilization was here back then at that time, but it was. So, you know, the... This knowledge is really old, old knowledge, and it's nothing to be scared of. It was actually used for good, but like I said, it's being kind of taken over and um, used to kind of uh, keep us in a lower frequency through fear. You know, they can put this energy into the water, basically. And it's interesting, you know, here in London, this is London, how they have all these dragons all around the whole town. You know, this is important knowledge, you know, dragon serpent knowledge. They're using it even in the town of London. Um, and you can see, you know, uh, that they know exactly what this means. The queen knows exactly what this means. And, um, you know, it's, it's just interesting to find this all out and to understand the whole history of, of civilizations and what this wisdom really is and it's kind of our birthright to be able to have access to this knowledge so we can you know basically heal ourselves and you know help um, help create a better world here's the ley lines across England where a lot of important um, sites are all built and the same thing is if you look at some of my other videos in the United States like you got Philadelphia Boston New York Trump Towers, uh, the Twin Towers, that's why they bombed them right there. It was on that ley line. The Statue of Liberty right through to Washington, D.C. is all on the same line. Okay, so they, they can create something dramatic in, in that line and create um, kind of a frequency to come through the planet. And here is Bush um, Sr., you know, his quote, a thousand points of light, this kind of stuck out at me because if you start reading about it, Trump criticizes it and kind of says, I wonder what that means. As soon as, you know, he says something like that, I go and start really digging on it. And the thousand points of light uh, made me start to think, what does that mean? Maybe it's a thousand pillars of light. And when I started Googling a thousand pillars of light, I came up with these hall of a thousand pillars that's in Asia. And I thought, oh my God, it looks just like a butte. 
right? It's the same thing as the Devil's Tower. It looks exactly the same shape. So they're imitating these old ancient crystal towers, I guess, that were probably on the planet at one point in time. You know, when we had big giant trees and um, maybe big giant crystal formations. So the Lord Shiva, now Shiva is the symbol outside of CERN and you know you can see it as the destroyer but it, it everything has double meaning so it has good and evil meaning it depends on your perception so if you want to see that as an evil god it, but it also has a, a good part to it if you look into the history of it so it's really your perception of how you want to feel about everything fear or love so here we have this other god that's in these pillars where the swan is part of the symbology so you know back to Cygnus and the swan and how important that is and then um, this other god sculpture is one of, seated on a swan and the, the sculptures are with uh, musical notes so we get into the Fibonacci um, sequence with the, the music and these pillars are called musical pil pillars so it's interesting so when it says musical pillars I'm thinking hmm these crystal um, boots are they part of the frequency, you know, for the planet, you know, and that's meaning when they say musical pillars, it's the same thing as the, the thousand points of light or thousand pillars of light. And here, um, what really stuck out at me on this was somebody decoded all the numerology for the, um, the gate at Titicaca in Peru with um, Viracota is the god there, or the Quinsicotal. Um, you know, equal to. Um, and what stood out here was that it was relating to um, the winter solstice and all the numbers were actually adding up to the zodiac. Um, and the 2,160 years is what each um, zodiac, each uh, one twelfth of the zodiac, that's what how many years are in it. And that whole gate has all the numbers adding to that you can go through this but yeah so it relates to the winter solstice and this is what i'm trying to tie up this whole video on is kind of bringing us all back to the winter solstice and and um the event the, of the golden age is going to be around the winter solstice here is the Viracota. um i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing that right but around his head he has um these 12 like feather things around, uh, 12, sorry, 24 things around his head. And, you know, all these numbers of all these little patterns are all relating to what I just showed you in the text uh, previous. Okay, we're coming back here to the uh, tarot cards and some of the numbers of the tarot cards. And we have the yod he va he So if you notice, the Va comes to the numbers 3, 6, and 9. And that's kind of our pyramid numbers that is in um, Vortex Math. And I've shown this in some of my other videos. And you can see the pattern um, once you get into 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, 5. It creates this W or upside down it would be an M. But if you look at a pyramid crossing that with a 9 on the top, if you go to the right and the left, you get to the 3, 6, and 9, which creates the pyramid. And that's Vortex Math. And uh, that is basically the freedom because it's not in the other uh, pattern. It's like separate to itself. So here we have um, the cards, the 22nd Hebrew letter to. It's the 21st card because the first card is a zero. Uh, so the 21st card, which is the universe card, is actually the 22nd tarot card. And all the numbers um, basically add up to the number 55, which is a sacred number. Here's the tarot cards and basically their numbers and what they represent. If you notice, I crossed out all the X's here. That adds up to 42, which breaks down to 6, which is the four um, crosses on the zodiac, which I showed you at the beginning of the video. But this is this different numbers here, you know, 21 meaning the universe. Um, seven is the chariot, which is the great bear, which is the constellation um, Ursa Major, which is the, the Big Dipper. Big Dipper is super important. And um, other things about the death card here. We have um, the horse, death riding and stepping over the prone king. So basically the king dies 
um, and it's a, which symbolizes how not even royalty can stop change. So like, yeah, so basically the whole suppression of the universe and how we've been suppressed or the universe, the planet, um, can't, nobody can stop this. This is, this is going to happen no matter what. And the lady that ended up drawing the pictures on the latest, well, the last uh, tarot card set, because they go way, way back in history, but the last set that was uh, created was at the turn of the 19th century. Um, her name was Smith. Yeah, and she, what's interesting is, you know, she was part of this um, Golden Dawn, you know, society, and which is all occult stuff. But what's interesting is there was... Um, uh, a copyright about her death, like when these cards were allowed to be re redistributed uh, for the copyright. And the thing is, it's 70 years after her death, and it comes out to the year 2021, which happens to be the last card of the tarot, um, which I find, you know, quite a coincidence. But um, there's 22 cards, but the first one is the Fool, which is zero. But the last one is the universe, which is the 21st card. And there was this big whole revolt with Aleister Crowley. You know, we all know he's the satanic leader of the, you know, he was satanic. But he went in there and he kind of broke up this golden age society. There was a big scandal. So what I'm saying is he kind of got in there and corrupted it. Now, Aleister Crowley is connected to the Bush family, uh, I believe, Barbara Bush is his daughter and she looks exactly like him. So if you ever want to look into that, it's kind of crazy. Um, so um, here we have Capricorn. Now Capricorn is not just a goat, it's a sea goat. Okay. And this has huge importance because it goes back to Enki, the god of intelligence, uh, creation and crafts, magic, water, the sea water, the lake water has to do with the rivers the age of Aquarius is water right even though it's a symbol for air but it's you know it's Aquarius it's it's referring to water um, and then we have you know the Catholic Church with all their fish hats <laughs> I find this stuff funny it goes back to Samaria but the fish is called the the dag which in German is day, right? So when we have the seven days of the week, we're having like the seven fish, you know? So it all goes back to religion and the symbology of religion. So I know you think like this all sounds crazy, but it all has history and it's history that we just haven't been told. So we don't have a clue about it. But when you go get your local coffee at their Starbucks, you're looking at a mermaid with a tail. Um, it's all relating to the same symbology, okay? so. It's crazy. Like it's in our faces, but we don't know it's there. If you don't know who Dan Winters is, you can check him out on YouTube. He goes into some really heavy stuff about um, ancient history with the Sumerian texts and the uh, cuneiforms and all the, the knowledge from the anthropologists that they've kind of done, um, put together who the um, ancient mythology uh, gods were and how they relate to our real history. Now, of course, mainstream history is not, you know, telling us this, but he's done some interesting study on um, Anton Parks and uh, Sitchin's uh, deciphering the Sumerian text and how they all interrelate. So here he's showing the, the letters you are, how they're used through a lot of our wording of different names and the reason why that's so important. It's the Ura, which comes from a tribe um, coming from the Pleiades and how they basically have um, intersected into humanity and basically kept us as slaves, which you know is what we're living through continually in a loop. So here is all the bloodlines and how they relate and who they their names are in different time periods and um, you know I guess this goes a little bit against biblical text but it's interesting to get a different perspective on things and to see things from a different point of view so if you're interested check him out. Now um, I went into some digging on some alchemic symbols just to try to understand um, the shapes and stuff and the S shape, this is the swan again. So we, arsenic is the swan. It's interesting because arsenic transforms itself. 
So the transformation is the swan, you know, going from the ugly duckling thing to the swan. This is about rebirth, about becoming enlightened. Okay, and we have arsenic. The symbol is the cross and ashes. Well, then when I see ashes, I think of the phoenix, you know, the ashes rising, the phoenix rising, coming from the ashes. So it's all there. And um, I was surprised to find the Merkaba in ancient Hebrew uh, Jewish mystical texts. I was really surprised to see this because this is what the New Age, you know, talks about the Merkaba being your pyramid, one going up, one going down. It creates the, you know, three-dimensional Star of David, which is your toroidal field, um, your armor of God. But it's interesting that it goes back into history through the biblical texts. And here we have um, Saturn. Saturn, it was called the Sabbath, Sabbatha. So it's like, I'm thinking, is that the Sabbath, you know, is Saturn. So, you know, when we start really looking into ancient history, we start to see everything relates to the planets and the star systems. So um, it's not something that we shouldn't be looking at. It's something we should be really interested in trying to learn from and uh, seeing uh, what the stars are basically, the sky is telling us and how it all relates to the zodiac. I did um, etymology on uh, Uranus, and which is just the root word, where the root came from, and it's called um, fire hearth of God and lion of God. Lion and the dragon, okay, so, you know, the lion is on part of the zodiac of the cross when we get into this time period. And then the dragon is like the dragon knowledge. Um, and so there's a bit of a thing going on between the tiger or lion with the dragon, and which ends up being with the, the Chinese zodiac, the Chinese years. So um, also here we have Thor, Thursday. Thursday is, Thor is basically part of Jupiter. And then you have Jove. You know, I find that funny, like, by Jove, you've got it. You know, that's basically, you're talking about Jupiter. You know, it's like the day of Zeus. So it, we don't even know what we're talking about. You know, like we're talking and we don't even understand where the root words come from. Um, here we have a strange bird, bird cry. Oh yeah, the swan song, the cry. And where I found interesting here was the swan is also the swine herd, which is the shepherd. Okay, so the, the swan is the shepherd, which has to do a lot with biblical texts. So we start to see, you know, things are starting to make sense now because it's starting to come into the sky. Here we have the etymology of um, the saying that's on the American um, dollar bill, at the bottom of the dollar bill, at the bottom of the pyramid. This relates to Jupiter as well. The all-powerful Jupiter favor my darling undertakings. This is what this this basically means. Give an easy course and and favor darling undertakings. So yeah, this whole Jupiter is basically, you know, part of the whole God understanding who God really is. And then the word capital um, is again Jupiter Atomus Maximus, protector of the city on the Capitol Hill. So yeah, they, they understand all this. Whoever built it and whoever named it, they knew what they were putting up there and um, exactly what this all means. It's part of the golden age. They're, they're trying to have, you know, the symbology of the, the golden age being in the Americas. Um, so here is Cygnus. And you can see it looking like a sword or a cross, the Jesus Christ cross, uh, depending on how you want to look at it. And of course, when it's upside down, we're considered, to, it's considered to be Satan, right? It's evil, but it's a sword. It's the sword of light. And we have this all through history, this whole sword, the, the light, you know, the bringer of the light is, is this light, this sword, the Jedi sword. So it's really how you perceive everything and how you want to interpret it. So here we have at the middle of this Cygnus uh, constellation is the letter P star. It's called the P star. Um, which is also, I found out here, it's Q, and Iraqi Jews call it the Q, and then it's the G. 
in the um, Miniate Jews. Now, the G is in the middle of the Freemason symbol. You know, so we've got the Q and the G equals the P. <laughs> it's pretty funny. So anyhow, um, and when we go on here, we have the swan again. Um, to see is, is a schwan, schwana. Is, it's basically so you can see that you're being, that you're programmed to be blind. You're basically awakening and you can see is that the enlightenment happens and you become the swan. You see through the BS. Here we have the meaning of um, sword again, which is the X, which, you know, brings us back to the symbol at the beginning on the big wheel. It's a big cross. Um, it's the sword. The cross is the sword. Okay, so um, it's the sword of light that basically comes up through your heart and opens your heart through love because if you have fear, you can't absorb this light, you know, from the heavens. You know, when this whole celestial cosmic thing happens, you won't be able to absorb it. So here is the Hebrew letter to, which is the 21st tarot trump. <laughs> That's funny. The trump, the universe card. It's the last card in the uh, tarot deck. And um, it's marked by seven stars, which V with each other under the guidance of ships of Greece to set sail to cross the seas. They used these constellations for, to help navigate, and they had huge significance. Um, the wagon of the heavens, which is basically this big cross that I was showing you at the beginning. Um, we have the bear Ursa Major is the Big Dipper, um, and it's always in the northern direction. Um, they're up at the northern pole, which has significance, and I'm going to explain why. It was also called the dog. The Ursa Minor was called the dog at one time, the wolf's tail, the trail to train the light. And here um, is one of the stars that's in Ursa Major. It's called the Miser Al. There's two stars. They're, they sit beside each other. And these are significant um, because it's actually the horse and the rider. So then we get the horse, um, you know, riding in on a horse. The white horse, you know, maybe that's where that whole myth came from. Um, the white horse is that star. Everything relates to the stars. So horse and rider, um, it's the 18th day. Um, and uh, what else does it say here? Oh, it's the star of the opener of the heat. You know, we're going to burn, you know, you got to ha handle the fire. Well, is that the star that opens up the heat or is it related to that? All I know is the constellations, Ursa Minor and Ursa Major, and the Draco constellation and Cygnus and Iradius, Iradanius is all super important. Here we have the uh, Mi'kmaq, um, ancient native tribe from Canada um, in Quebec, um, in Gaspé Peninsula, um, they were using this Christ cross, which, you know, I find that kind of bizarre because I'm sure at way, way back there was no Christianity, um, but they have the cross. So it's basically Cygnus. Um, here we have Ursa Major. This is the whole constellation, but we see the, the spoon right at the top there. Now, the bottom of the spout, if you go straight across in the sky from that spout, it points towards the North, um, the North Star, which is always permanent, which is the tail end of Ursa Minor. Okay, so the two dippers uh, work towards each other. Now, what's interesting is the Big Dipper, when it points towards the east, it's spring, towards the south, it's summer, towards the west, it's um, uh, fall, and towards the north, it's winter. So that's how they knew their seasons. And here I'm showing you, yeah, the spout work goes right towards the, the pole. I didn't get the whole pole picture in there, but it, that's where it goes to. Um, and you can always find the North uh, Pole, Polaris, um, by, you know, figuring out from the Big Dipper. You can always see the Big Dipper. There's interesting um, showers that happen from Ursid. Anything with Ur has significance. It has to do with ancient um, Sumerian um, Jerusalem, Hungary, the word, when we see the U-R together, 
it has significance. So this is why this thing popped out at me. It's uh, December 17th, which is until the 25th. So it's in the um, winter solstice week. Yeah, so it's basically some meteor showers and it also relates to the planet Jupiter. And it just happens to be in the winter solstice week. That's why it kind of popped out in me. So with the Earth's in meteor showers, there's this big comet in it. And uh, the comet is called 8P uh, Tuttle. And it has a part of the Jupiter family comets. And it also um, is in close conjunction with the spiral galaxy M33. Um, and that has um, the Ad Andromedon galaxy in it. Um, and this meteor shower happens around the winter solstice. So this comet when I start really looking into it, it, it comes every 13.7 years and it will be returning um, in 2022. And the, it's interesting because the center of it is actually turned into a peanut shape. Um, and it's turned into a peanut shape because they believe that it's actually um, hit um, Jupiter at some point in time. So that makes me think because we started, you know, having this theory that Jupiter is going to be the new sun um, is because in the golden age, what's going to create all the light? You know, there's not going to be night anymore. It's just going to be bright all the time. So somehow Jupiter gets activated. So I'm thinking, is it possible this comet hits Jupiter since it's passing right through it? And it's also in the constellation Cygnus. That's where it's at. And here is the orbit pattern. You can see it coming through and it hits right into Jupiter. And it's already hit there because it has a peanut shape and they've done a little bit of an article here talking about it. Here's some of the mythology associated with comets. They're the dragon, serpent, sword, spears and arrows, long haired bearded, beams, burning torch, burning lamp, thunderbolt, swatsika, broom, sweeping away the old broom star, stone from the sky, chariot, sickle and the omega symbol. I know some people think that the swastika is like um, the positioning of the Big Dipper as it turns in the sky but you can see in this ancient picture it definitely has dragon heads. So it is turning, it is the plasma event that happens in the sky. And here you can see the swastika in really ancient times but it's not just the swastika, it's a very long arm swastika so these are the the plasma arms that come out from this uh, plasma event. Anthropologists are discovering that a lot of these ancient sites are uh, aligning to the winter solstice. So the events in the sky um, are, were very important to these civilizations and the winter solstice seems to be a, a very important uh, time period. Needless to say, the year 2022 is starting to really stick out for me on the December 21st winter solstice. The number 222 adds up to 6, which is uh, the Star of David, the Pyramid Up, the Pyramid Down, um, or the Merkaba, and uh, also the Sixth Day of Creation. So the Universe card in the Tarot cards is the 21st card, but it's also the 22nd card because of the Zero Fool card. The universe as the end of completion, so it's the completion number, the number 22, a symbol of the zenith of development, the achieved goal. There's a whole myth to the Draco dragon constellation. There's different myths at different time periods, but they 